Thank you, Hans, for that uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be with you all today. Uh, it's, a, it's a distinct honor to be the, to provide the Catholic diversity here at the, uh, at the Summer Institute. I, I, usually I'm accustomed to being the Latino diversity, but this is a, this is a nice change of pace. <laughs> I don't know how things are gonna go. Uh, 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 um, okay, so what I've decided to do, I'm sure you all have taken a look at, uh, I guess the title of my talk, uh, One of Us Catholic Teaching on Disability since 1878. Um, uh, uh, what I've decided to do is to take my cue, uh, my lead-in from an encyclical letter that was written by Pope Leo XIII. Everyone knows Pope Leo, of course. Uh, uh, and he wrote it in 1878. Uh, the title of this encyclical is Quad Apostolici Muneres. Quad Apostolici Muneres. Um, now, here's the three-sentence summary of that encyclical. Uh, there was an emerging social ideology that was pitting those with a few possessions, so the poor, against those with an abundance of possessions, the rich or the wealthy. And, uh, and this emerging social ideology that Pope Leo XIII was writing about uh, was saying that the poor uh, had a right uh, to steal from anyone who had above average wealth. Uh, that, was, that was what was going on. Uh, so Pope Leo, uh, he was concerned about this, especially as it was inflecting itself in various Catholic communities, uh, because the uh, 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 poor Catholics were viewing wealthy Catholics as their enemies, and wealthy Catholics were viewing poor Catholics as a threat. And so uh, he wrote a response, and this is what this uh, encyclical is. So uh, the, the gist of his response is, okay, first of all, uh, <clears throat> personal property, it's a human right. You know, we can own things. And also, uh, uh, FYI, uh, stealing is still a sin, so don't do that. Um, uh, that was the first part of it. Now, the other part of it was that if any Christian has more than they need, uh, Christ commands that they give it away to those who are in need. Uh, so that was, uh, that was his response to this uh, emerging social ideology. And what I want to do is I want to pick up on two points in Pope Leo's argument. And the ones that are, uh, they're points that are often overlooked in reading the, uh, the, uh, in the reading of this encyclical because, you know, folks focus on the social acts aspect. Uh, Particularly, it's, it's, there's a critique of a, a certain ideology of socialism, and it's oftentimes regarded as the, the beginning of Catholic social teaching. Uh, uh, some of the main themes of Rerum Novarum, if that means anything to you, uh, are, are tested out in this letter. Um, so here's the two points I want to pick up. The first one from Pope Leo is that inequalities, inequities of strength, uh, intelligence, and possession, these are part of life. They're part of life because we're embodied creatures, we're embodied beings, and so the contingency of our material bodies, there's inequalities that are oftentimes not cho chosen, many times are not chosen. And that these differences of strength, of intelligence and possession, uh, uh, when they're not chosen, don't necessarily make us enemies right out of the gate. The second point that I wanted to pull out and, and, and tug on from Pope Leo's encyclical is the way Christians navigate their differences of strength, intelligence, and possession, it's rooted in the Christian conception of the human being. That we are creatures. That we are creatures created in the image of God. That we're creatures, responsive and engaged with the Creator. So what, I wanna, what I'm proposing to do here is to present my best understanding of the Catholic view, the Catholic way of talking about our fragility as creatures. Um, so there's two things you need to know um, about my account of the Catholic view. And the first thing I should probably tell you, if you need to know anything about my account of the Catholic view, I need to tell you a little bit about my brother. Uh, so Brian talked about, you know, uh, you got to tell your story yesterday. And I was, uh, after Brian's talk yesterday, I was nervous. It's like, oh my goodness, am I, should, I, should I mention my brother? Should I mention Vicente? No. Uh, in any case, this is my brother. So my brother Vicente. Uh, Vicente is my older brother uh, from the day of his birth, uh, which was also the day of his baptism because they didn't think he was going to live. Uh, Vicente has lived with a profound cognitive impairment. Uh, my brother Vicente, he doesn't walk, he can't talk, uh, he can't take care of himself in any meaningful way, and as far as we can tell, my brother uh, doesn't understand our words when we speak with him, although uh, he, he does understand the tone of your voice. Uh, like if you're being a grump or if you're happy or if people are laughing, he obviously gets that. 
So my brother Vicente, he has deep brown, deep dark brown eyes. He has sharp cheekbones and thick black hair. Um, my brother's arms are long and muscular, but the rest of his body is stiff uh, below the chest. Uh, bathing, diapers, medication, grooming, all those ordinary things of ordinary life. Uh, Vicente's health, his wellness, his cleanliness, and general well-being, this all depends on the, uh, on the care of my family. And Vicente's always lived at home. He's always lived with family. Uh, and he lives with, uh, with my family now. Um, uh, with my, uh, my wife, our four kids, and my mom is also with us. Um, Vicente doesn't make eye contact, uh, but he's always had an open and receptive posture towards whatever's happening around him. So central to the traditional Catholic understanding of, of persons like my brother is the presumption that they are not exceptional. Nothing about Vicente's condition, strictly speaking, makes him special. My brother is not special. That is to say, Vicente does not belong to any kind or class of beings other than the human species. You know, my brother's certainly a unique individual. He has his good days and bad days, both good hair days and bad hair days. However, like every other human being, the characteristics and qualities that distinguish him from other persons don't in any way change the kind of being that he is. In the ordinary way that Christians confess God as the creator of humanity, God holds, my, God holds my brother's being and existence and relates to my brother, relates to Vicente, in the same way God relates to every other individual member of the human species. So, I have a rule, and it's a rule that I've kept intact and have done my best to keep to since I began writing about these things and thinking about these things theologically. Uh, my rule is this, when it comes to talking about human vulnerability and the fragility of our flesh. Whatever I say about my brother formally, uh, qua intellectual creature, an image of God, whatever I say about him, I have to be able to say about myself. And whatever I say formally about myself, I must be able to say about my brother. So these two rules uh, extend to uh, formal theological accounts of human nature, our creaturely dignity, our vocational aptitude, and the, the, the call to Christian discipleship. So of course, allowing for accidental differences in, in the particularities of our lives, uh, any further formal distinction between my brother and I is heretical, probably. Um, that's my presumption, at least. So, what I'd like for us to do is I, I'd like for us to think about the way Christian theologians think about the human body. In particular, the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh. Thinking about these matters, the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh, I, I think it's important for Christian theologians today, given our common tendency to regard the fragility of our flesh as neither good nor beautiful. If I have any hope about, uh, about these remarks, it's that I hope that it'll serve as a reminder, because I don't think I'm saying anything all that new, but I hope it'll serve as, as a reminder of why Christians reject moral systems and theological outlooks that bypass or ignore our innate creaturely vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury. So the recognition that we are composite creatures, a spiritual and corporeal unity, this is basic to the Christian understanding of the human being. For this reason, Christian doctrine on our integral dignity has always included an affirmation of the goodness of the human body, and likewise an affirmation that the innate vulnerability of our bodies, that it coincides with the harmony of our specific place in the good order of God's creation. In other words, uh, Christians believe that the vulnerability and coordinate dependencies of the human body are essential creaturely goods. I'll say that again. Christians believe that the vulnerability and coordinate dependencies of the human body are essential creaturely goods, enduring aspects of our original nakedness, which are not in themselves a cause for shame. These gifts of our vulnerability and dependency, these are among the natural goods that predicate our greatest good and final perfection as incarnate intellectual creatures formed in the image and toward the likeness of triune God. 
So this is a distinctively Christian understanding. This is a distinctively Christian way of talking about the fragility of our flesh and the significance of our flesh. This Christian way of talking about these things, this understanding of human nature and human dignity, it flows directly from the good news of God's love for the world revealed in and through Jesus Christ. That is to say, Christian theological anthropology is regulated by Christian belief in the origin, history, status, and destiny of the human being amid the ongoing act of creation, the utter gratuity of our dignity, original innocence, this is the story, original sin, the fall, the incarnation of God in Christ, reconciliation, bodily resurrection, beatitude. So considered by way of that revealed history, the history of grace, the various post-lapsarian disclosures of our innate vulnerability are rightly regarded as privations of a relative corporeal good. Now I'm using a word there. I use the word privations. I'm going to use another word. And I'm going to ask you to trust me in how I use this word. Uh, if it bears out in the end, then maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe this doesn't reflect the Christian tradition. But I hope that you'll walk with me. Privations of relative corporeal goods. However, those defects, those defects and infirmities cannot diminish our incarnate creaturely dignity and cannot displace the fittingness of our composite nature. I want to pause, and I have to pause on how we use that word defect within the Christian intellectual tradition. This is important, and this matters. And we have to pause here, because uh, it's easy to mistake, and it's easy to assume that uh, when we use the word defect, we have in our mind the sorts of uh, uh, ways of construing and alienating and marginalizing humanity from the past 150 years in Western history. Not exclusively the last 150 years, but we just had technologies and uh, 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 systems of uh, uh, of organization that allowed us to do it on a scale that is unprecedented, ugly, and awful. The theological use of the word defect could, could be understood like this, and if this matters for how we use it, for how we understand and receive the Christian tradition, the teachings of Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, but also the resources of Scripture. Uh, one way to think about it, and this isn't always the best way to do it, but if you were to break down the word uh, etymologically, a defect so D, D-E, away, and facare, which is uh, the Latin for to make or to do. So a defect is a, is a condition that is away from doing. It's away from acting. It's not all that different from the way we use the word disability in an ordinary way, uh, analogous to the medical model of, of disability. There's not the same sort of ontological or moral attachments to that word defect. But of course, in ordinary conversation, this word, it, it causes us to pause and causes us to worry. So the Christian affirmation of our specifically incarnate intellectual dignity, the fittingness of our vulnerability, and the enduring goodness of corporeality in light of the fall, these three doctrines function as anthropological principles for the distinctively Christian theological consideration of the integral good proper to the human being and moral theological descriptions of human happiness. So here's my interest in this essay, and here's my interest in these remarks, is that the way these particular anthropological principles, so our specific dignity, the dignity that I share with my brother and my brother shares with me, what we have in common, the fittingness of our vulnerability, that our vulnerability is not a curse, it is, it is part of who we are, the kind of beings that we are. And the goodness of corporeality, the enduring goodness of corporeality. These principles, the way they're navigated in contemporary Christian theology matters. And I think, I think, that when we attend to how these principles work, uh, we, when we're reminded, when we remind ourselves of what the Christian tradition has for us, it can help us think well about the fragility of our flesh. So the particular animating concern, what motivates me in this regard, is a somewhat consistent reoccurring tendency to either avoid or muddle these principles. Indeed, in some quarters of Christian theology, the suggestion that our corporeal vulnerability is an essential and fitting creaturely good, some theologians regard that as inconsistent with Christian doctrine on original sin and the fall. <clears throat> 
These are theologians who think that, that, vulner, that the vulnerability of our bodies to external effects, it's a primeval curse that corrupts human nature and undermines human dignity. There are theologians out there who think in that way. In other quarters of Christian theology, the mention of evil, sin, or defect, these, these thick theological words from the Christian uh, tradition, from Scripture, to mention these words in relation to bodily impairment, illness, and injury, it might be regarded as having elitist and chauvinistic, if not dangerously eugenic implications. Implications that threaten to undermine the dignity of persons who have some form of impairment. So the concern from that perspective would be that the Christian affirmation uh, of our inalienable dignity, that it, it, we would have to be able to account for that in a way that's abstracted from these inconvenient aspects of the gospel. Sin, evil, something of our failure to, uh, to, to act. So the breadth and depth of this contemporary problem, this struggle, this muddle, in how we use these words, how we think about the fragility of our flesh, is struck in high relief when we consider how the topic of disability is considered theologically, is conceived and navigated theologically, both engaged and avoided in contemporary Christian systematic moral and ethical discourse. So my overarching contention is this, and this is, uh, this is a, 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 the lead that I take from Pope Leo XIII. I take this to be consistent with the teachings of Aquinas. With a, uh, this is my, it's my best understanding of what Pope John Paul II, uh, the teachings of Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Francis. Uh, this is my best understanding of it. My overall arching contention is that persistence of avoidance or confusion about those three anthropological principles if we avoid those themes, it undermines the coherence and integrity of Christian reflection on the goodness and beauty of our bodies. More precisely, uh, uh, it can be broken down like this. First, I would propose, and I think this is the proposal from the, uh, not only from the Catholic Christian intellectual tradition, but from the Christian intellectual tradition, that any theological account of the human good and human happiness is incomplete if it cannot and does not account for how that life is possible for the kind of beings that we are. We're intellectual creatures, composite beings formed in the image of God, beings who are by nature, among other things, variously and unequally vulnerable to impairment, illness, and injury. Second, any moral, theological, or Christian ethical account of the human being, of human impairment, illness, and injury in particular, it's incomplete if it doesn't and cannot account for how that outlook held forth, the moral good, the ethical good, if, if it can't describe how that good coheres with the basic doctrines of Christian faith, including, among, among other things, Christian doctrine on our specific dignity, the essential goodness and relative aff, uh, uh, afflictions of our bodies, and the corporeal consequences of the fall. So I basically want to do three things in, in, in the time that remains. I want to talk about the concept of disability. And I want to talk about a contemporary theological muddle related to the body, which I hope and I think will help us make sense of how Christians use that word defect. And I want to talk about, third, I want to talk about the fact that, that some theologians think my brother is ugly. There are some theologians there are some theologians who think my brother is objectively ugly, that the condition of his body is neither good nor beautiful. So I have a bone to pick on this front, and I've chosen to pick that bone with the help of St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> I mean, as long as you don't have a flight before Thursday at noon, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Okay, so to begin with, a Christian challenge to the concept of disability. There are some common presumptions that are in the water, and uh, most of you are probably familiar with these presumptions, regarding the way theologians use the concept of disability. These presumptions, uh, they don't necessarily present equally in every case, in every uh, theological text, or in every theological conversation about disability. 
You know, but a person could easily claim that in most contemporary uh, uh, theological engagements with disability, engagements that it intentionally uh, think and speak uh, about disability, or avoid the topic of disability, that they've appropriated at least one of these presumptions. So I'm going to list these presumptions that I think are in the water. First, there's a presumption that the ability and disability distinction is a self-evident and unproblematic natural division within humanity. That's the first one. That the ability-disability distinction is a self-evident and unproblematic natural division within humanity. Second, there's a presumption that the concept disability, that that concept can function as an internally coherent, conceptually stable, all historical category in Christian theological discourse. So there's a presumption that the concept disability can function as an internally coherent, conceptually stable, all historical category in Christian theological discourse. And third, there's a presumption that the Christian theological tradition holds human impairment, illness, and injury to be unequivocally bad, objectively ugly, and definitively tragic corporeal states. Those are three presumptions. So what's interesting to me about these three presumptions concerning disability, the concept of disability, is that none of these come even close from, uh, from the Christian perspective, as I understand it, to being historically demonstrable or theologically defensible in relation to Christian anthropology and the various ways the human experience of corporeal uh, impairment, illness, and injury has been accounted for in the Christian tradition. Now, there's a couple ways you could describe, if you wanted to categorize what I'm saying here, uh, this could be described as a critical theological approach to disability. Uh, for those who, who, who know uh, Leonard Davis or Lycia Carlson, this is how they would frame what I'm doing here. Uh, it could be called a critical theological approach to disability. I prefer to call it uh, traditional the traditional Christian account of the human being, uh, specifically for reasons that I'll go on to discuss. I don't find any significant support in the Christian theological tradition for the presumption that the ability-disability distinction is a self-evident and natural division of humanity. Likewise, I don't find any support in the presumption, uh, for the presumption that the concept of disability has internal coherence and semantic stability for Christian theological discourse. And third, I don't find any support for the presumption that human impairment, illness, and injury are unequivocally bad, objectively ugly, or definitively tragic corporeal states. Another way of saying this is, I, I think Christians have better ways of talking about the fact that our bodies break, about the fact that our bodies are sometimes impaired, get sick, present with a diversity of competencies and dependencies, and that our, we eventually die. Christians begin with an evangelical presumption rooted in the gospel about the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh our specific dignity, the fittingness of our vulnerability and the good order of God's creation and the enduring goodness of corporeality after the fall. In other words, the problem seems to be a theologically unfounded contemporary confidence in the nature, meaning, and valuation of the concept disability by those who intentionally engage disability theologically and those who intentionally avoid the topic altogether because it's not their thing. It's, they're not interested in it. Specifically, just to the extent that the organizing concept of disability lacks a consistent concrete reference and conceptual stability, I, I don't think it can serve as much more than a provisional, ad hoc heuristic for, distinguish, for distinguishing between different modes of Christian theological engagement. Now, this is not to say, and I, I don't want to be heard this way, this is not to say that the concept of disability is useless. I, I'm, I'm not saying that. Rather, it's only to suggest that disability as a concept might not be the best place for Christian theologians to begin if they're concerned to think about our innate vulnerability uh, to impairment, illness, and injury. So let me walk through those presumptions and let me present what I take to be a uh, the uh, standard argument against those, those presumptions. So first, the ability-disability distinction. The ability-disability distinction is descriptively accurate when focused on specific corporeal faculties, 
that are antecedently stipulated as determinative or valuable at a particular time in a particular context. Uh, one way of saying that, that, another way of saying that is that ability disability is something you can say in a particular, at a particular time in a particular moment, say if you're describing uh, a, a very narrow difference between my brother and I. But that use is qualified. From the perspective of, of Christian theology, what cannot be directly captured in the ability-disability distinction, say, the distinction between my brother and I, is each person's, our fundamental, ongoing creaturely dependence upon God for our existence, our uh, individual, personal, natural aptitude for, uh, apprehension, uh, for apprehension and contemplation of truth. And because we're incarnate intellectual creatures, the ability-disability distinction can't capture the spectrum of spiritual and corporeal competencies and dependencies that every person exercises in relation to his or her neighbor, regardless of ability, over a lifetime. So understood in this way, for Christians, the ability-disability distinction, it divides humanity in the same way that uh, asleep or awake, or child or parent, or mourner or comforter, or, and comforter, like those kinds of dynamics, in the same way that these divide humanity. There's a meaningful distinctions, but their meaning is neither self-evident, nor are they ever innocent of, a, a, of explicitly or implicitly stipulated values that, are, that give conceptual form to the distinction. Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean that the ability-disability distinction has no use as a, as a framework for Christian theologians. Rather, it means that any distinction between the disabled us and the non-disabled them, or the non-disabled us and the disabled them, that distinction is always qualified. It's always circumscribed, and it's always ad hoc, unique to a particular situation. Specifically, the distinction is useful with reference to the particular experience of particular persons or groups, but dramatically less useful uh, as, uh, as something that defines the human experience. For example, the concept is useful when describing a particular moment of a specific social or political dynamic, but that utility stops at a particular point and quickly dissolves when that sociopolitical reality is framed by the lifetime of the various individuals involved, because all of us are at some point vulnerable and dependent. From the beginning of our lives to the very end of our lives, on the spectrum of the ordinary life, no one is free from dependency. It's only the snapshot, the snapshot of a particular moment. I tell my students, I say, you know, uh, uh, everyone in here at one time was incontinent. incontinent. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, presumably, hopefully, someone loved you enough uh, to, uh, to, attend, to attend to your body when you were incontinent. And I, and I said, and, you know, if you are blessed and if you are fortunate, 30, 40, 50 years from now, you once again will be incontinent. Uh, and you'll be fortunate if someone once again loves you enough to attend to the condition of your body. This is, this is normal. It's only when we look at the snapshot of a particular moment that this distinction makes sense. All of us, all of us have been there and will be there again. So in other words, when our theological thinking begins with the presumption that ability and disability, the able-bodied, against the disabled bodied? If we begin with that presumption, that division, that this is a natural division of humanity, a clear and stable distinction within the human species, we implicitly assume metaphys metaphysical categories and principles that make it difficult to articulate the unity of humanity in the way Christians do it, as creatures created in the image of God. And importantly, and this is, this is the part that worries me, is that when we cede that ground, we also give away dogmatic, uh, the dogmatic and doctrinal ground to formulate the distinctively Christian theological critiques, moral arguments, and practical guidelines that are relevant to our innate vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury. So second, the theological, on the theological use of the concept of disability. So across the modes of engagement um, that y'all are familiar with, uh, of, of engaging the concept of disability, there's a theologically unfounded confidence, I would say, some would say, many would say actually, in the concept of disability, and that it stands as internally coherent 
and conceptually stable. That it's an awe historical category that floats above us. Uh, and that it's, uh, it gives us sufficient ground, sufficient purchase to, to, uh, to speak and think and argue theologically. Well, I, I think that confidence lacks warrant, at least from the Christian tradition. On the level of grammar, uh, the invocation of disability, the concept and the word, it carries with it either explicitly or implicitly not only the semantic content, content of its contrast, so whatever happens to constitute ability at that time and place, but the invocation of the word disability also carries with it embedded cultural and historical presumptions about the disabled subject. That is to say, a disabled what? Well, a disabled human being, of course, but, but what is the aspect or horizon of consideration for the human being? And what is the purpose of this distinction? In this way, basic judgments about what it means to be a human being are always incorporated into the way we use the concept of disability, the way it's deployed in theoretical and theological and philosophical discourse. So the standard disability models are the perfect example of this, and I, I'm confident virtually everyone in here knows about, uh, or is familiar with the, 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 the generic models. Each of these models uh, presumes a particular aspect of consideration, a referent, and there's an outcome, there's a telos embedded in the way of using these words. We're talking about the medical model, uh, the social model, the, uh, the, the cultural model, the minority model, uh, the charity model, uh, 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 the, the, the religious model, uh, the, uh, in any case, we can go on. Uh, uh, so we, we can just talk about the, the medical model. As most are aware, the medical model of disability, it works on a horizon of function, dysfunction. And the referent, is, the, the lim is delimited, it's narrowed down to the faculties and operations of the human body. And the generic goal of the medical model is to see uh, dysfunctional bodies transition from a state of uh, dysfunction to a state of function. So the standard, uh, at least re most recently, the standard amongst disability theorists and philosophers uh, was to contrast the impairment defined by the medical model with the disability defined by the social model. So uh, this, that standard amongst uh, uh, leading disability theorists and philosophers uh, in the past, I would say, decade, has kind of fallen out of favor uh, because it lacks precision and because there's, there's a serious question being raised about how we use the word disability in our culture, um, its utility. So the social model of disability works on a horizon of inclusion and exclusion. You all know this, where the reference is the sociopolitical status of a person who has an impairment within a particular community, community. And the particular goal is to see persons who are impaired transition from a state of exclusion to inclusion. Now, because the social model framework is widely and consistently used in contemporary Christian uh, uh, discourse around the topic of disability, it affords us a, an apt illustration of the theologically unfounded confidence that many of us have, that I have sometimes, uh, when we use the concept of disability. So here would be a good place for an extended conversation about, okay, let's look at particular instances, particular ways that uh, the, uh, the social model of disability is either explicitly or implicitly inflected in theological work. Um, so we can save that for another day. Uh, 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 maybe someone out there wants to write it. Um, uh, please write it. Uh, so, but uh, but a clar clarification is important here. Uh, the theological problem with the social model of disability it's not, is not its use as an analytic tool or a resource for description. I want to say that again. The theological problem with the social model of disability, it's not its use as an analytic tool or as a resource for description. Certainly, as a theoretical framework for describing the sociopolitical experience of persons who have a, a physiological, a psychological, or cognitive impairment, the social model of disability, it's useful, it's effective, it provides an effective framework for argument within communities that have no binding loyalties or shared conceptions of the human good. For example, in our society, there's no disagreement uh, that the social model of disability and its attendant aspects of consideration, its reference and purpose, that it's been politically expedient and conceptually useful for, cra for crafting U.S. legislation on the rights of Americans with disabilities to protect rights, to secure fair access, to enforce civil accommodations. However, and this is the important point, this tool, 
This tool is useful for Christian theology only so long as it, is, as it is understood that the theoretical models can only afford us an incomplete understanding of any social situation. These tools are only useful for Christian theology so long as it's understood that the th theoretical models can only afford us an incomplete understanding of any given social situation. So the theological problem it's not that Christians sometimes use the social model of disability to theorize or conceive the entailments of certain sociopolitical realities. That's, that's not the problem. Rather, the theological problem is when Christian theologians, when we here in this room, uncritically presume or, att or attribute comprehensiveness to the social model's way of framing and guiding theoretical discourse on disability. By one description, when the concept of disability is framed and directed according to the terms of the social model of disability, Christian theological discourse, it appropriates a, a, a relationally two-dimensional and reductively materialistic description of the spiritual corporeal reality of the human being. Moreover, when Christian theologians deploy the formulation of disability defined along the horizon of inclusion and exclusion, it becomes extraordinarily difficult to discuss the human experience of, uh, of a particular impairment in relation to our incarnate intellectual dignity, our incarnate dignity, our fittingness, the fittingness of our vulnerability, and then the enduring goodness of corporeality. A temporary inclusion may have been won. This is Hans talks about this. A temporary inclusion may have been won, um, but the condition for friendship and the conditions for the common good have not been established, at least according to the Christian outlook. When Christian theologians uncritically incorporate the terms, categories, and relative insights of the concept of disability into our theological reflection on human impairment, illness, and injury, we likewise incorporate a constellation of metaphysical and anthropological uh, presuppositions. The consequence of, inattentive, uh, of inattentiveness to these implications is the thinning out of traditionally and conceptually thick biblical and theological concepts into two-dimensional two -dimensional sociopolitical metaphors. Exclusion, inclusion, rights, alienation, access, barriers, accommodation, and participation. There's nothing wrong with these concepts. These are wonderful concepts. These are wonderful words. However, absent the horizon and outlook of Christian discourse, on the revelation of God's love for the world revealed in and through Jesus Christ, those concepts can only provide a partial description of any problem, and they can only propose, they can only help us imagine incomplete means for remediation. So disability, I would say, is not special. Um, The, uh, as, I said, as I mentioned Vicente, my brother, you know, there's, uh, there's something about growing, uh, I, I know yesterday I was mentioning about siblings, and that's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a sensitive topic for me. Um, um, my experience of growing up with my brother was an experience of uh, sometimes anger and frustration about how people interacted with him and engaged him. Um, you sent the, there's nothing wrong with my brother. He's, he's, uh, his, his body is different just like the rest of our bodies. Uh, uh, he's weak just like we're all weak. Uh, you know, he also can be a smart ass sometimes too, uh, in his own way. Uh, there's nothing wrong with my brother. He's not special. He's not different. He's one of us. He's, he's me. He, uh, not that he could be me, he isn't me. We're different people. But still, there's nothing wrong with him. He's, he's, he's impaired. He has an injury. You know, I have impairments and injuries too. And this isn't to flatten out uh, the distinctiveness of our, of our corporeal conditions. But from the beginning of, uh, uh, of my understanding of these matters as, as a kid, uh, anything without my brother any description, any theological account of the way things are, of what it means to be a human being that excluded him as a man with a profound and utterly debilitating cognitive impairment, uh, 
it bristled against me. In fact, that was what initially took me into the theology of St. Thomas. Uh, uh, my initial impression of the theology of St. Thomas was that uh, what it meant to be a human being was, was to have the capacity for discursive reasoning, to be a rational animal. This is what I understood to be the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. So my first course when I took, uh, when I entered into, uh, after seminary and began graduate school, my first course, one of my first courses was on St. Thomas, and I went in there with one agenda. I need to figure out why St. Thomas is wrong. Because the way St. Thomas describes the world excludes my brother and God is my witness, I will end this. <laughs> I was very fortunate to have a professor who uh, responded to my concerns, not in a way that was patronizing or condescending, uh, but actually encouraging. He said, take it to St. Thomas forcefully with your very best thinking and see what he, ha he has to say. Make sure you understand Thomas before you reject him. Make sure you understand him before you throw him away because you just may find that he will provide you with a way forward that you couldn't imagine before. I mean, the quick version of this is that Aquinas distinguishes between our intellect, uh, uh, what specifies us as creatures, is the intellect. Uh, 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 there's something about us, because we're composite creatures, we're not only our bodies, but there's something about us that would exceed the body that allows us to, uh, to recognize goodness, truth, and beauty, absolute goodness, truth, and beauty. And that's different from the capacity for reason. My brother doesn't have, as far as I know, uh, the capacity for discursive reasoning. Him and I have never had a conversation, which, not for lack of trying, he's just, he, I see he's the strong, quiet type, and he is. Um, <laughs> but even if we can't have a conversation, and it's unclear to me how, if, he's cap you know, if he has the capacity for discursive reasoning, I know that he knows in the distinctively human way that he's able to recognize the form. That uh, This is a... a theological aesthetics, that, that, he, that he's capable of recognizing goodness, truth, and beauty in the world in the distinctively human way. So disability is not special. My brother is not special. And that's how I say it. We have a stake as Christians, as Christian theologians, in recovering creatureliness and vulnerability in the way we talk about the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh. This matters, this is worth it. It's worth doing this, this difficult theological and philosophical work because of the rewards at the end. And we don't even have to pretend and hope that there will be rewards at the end. We can look at it in the Christian tradition about how other theologians uh, have been able to work it out. St. Hildegard of Bingham, for example. So the challenges surrounding contemporary theological engagement with uh, and avoidance of the concept of disability, I've argued, <clears throat> I'm not quite done yet, but uh, uh, helps us recognize a contemporary problem in the way we go about the work of theology. The way forward I'm proposing involves renewed engagement with the constellation of anthropological principles named at the outset. So our specifically incarnate and intellectual dignity, the fittingness of our vulnerability, and the enduring goodness of corporeality in light of the fall. Now it remains the case that the concept or the topic of disability, it marks an important distinction uh, a set of differences in the way we speak and think theologically about disability today. Now, among the most pressing to me is to make sense of uh, what you would hope is the intuition and goodwill of people who, as a matter of principle, avoid the topic of disability. They say, yeah, it's not my, not my bag, it's not my thing. It's like, hey, that's great that you have this special topic, this special interest in disability. It's not my thing. This, it seems to me, the case of the principled avoider. It offers a, a clear instance of how uncritical theological use of the concept disability amongst those of us who are practical specialists in the, on, on, on the theological engagement, when it comes to theological engagement with disability, and those of us who use the concept of disability instrumentally. That, that these two ways of using the concept of disability uh, 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 uncritically it can have an impact on the wider horizon of contemporary theological discourse. For example, uncritical use of the concept of disability, it could be said, has made it possible for those who avoid the topic of disability as a matter of principle, 
It's made it possible for them to imagine that our innate vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury is a special accessory subdiscipline of Christian theology. Along, alongside the invention of some sort of genre called uh, disability theology or theologies of disability, came the rationale to distinguish theological discourse on our innate vulnerability to impairment, illness, and injury as specialist. And, uh, uh, and, and further, to isolate these engagements from systematic and fundamental moral theology. I don't think it's a special discipline. I think Christian theological discourse on what it means to be a human being includes our innate vulnerability to uh, impairment, illness, and injury. This is not its own class. This is, this is Christian Theological Anthropology 101. Second, I also think that uncritical use of the concept of disability has made it difficult for theologians who intentionally avoid uh, uh, the special topic of disability to recognize how their theological outlook is impoverished, absent serious engagement with our innate vulnerabilities and, co and coordinate dependencies. We're doing a disservice if we don't use this word well to wider Christian theological discourse. So the third presumption I don't want to talk about uh, it has to do with uh, the badness, ugliness, and tragedy of disability. So there's nothing exclusively Christian about uh, challenging the self-evidence of the ability-disability uh, distinction as a natural division. Christians do it, but you know, the best philosophers today are also doing it. Uh, they're, they're recognizing that, you know, that it, when you really push on, it doesn't hold water. Likewise, there's nothing exclusively Christian about challenging the internal coherence and conceptual stability of the concept disability. Now, the third presumption I noted was the common view that the Christian theological tradition holds human impairment, illness, and injury to be unequivocally bad, objectively ugly, and a definitively tragic corporeal state. So here's what I want to do in this final section. I wanted to discuss and outline some parts of the distinctively Christian understanding of our impairment, illness, and injury as regulated by Christian belief in the origin, history, status, and destiny of the human being. I want to talk about our impairment, illness, and injury, our innate vulnerability, in a way that talks about God as creator, that you know, mentions Jesus, that uh, is, is able to not only give an account of sin, original sin and the fall, but actually provide insights. This is what I think the best thinking uh, about our innate vulnerability provides us and can give us if we do this work well. So my particular interest is to explain why some Christians reject any doctrinal outlook that underwrites a categorically negative regard for the vulnerability of our bodies and our various and unequal experience of the same. I want to explain why Christians reject that kind of doctrinal outlook. So one contemporary model, and this is the one I want to focus on, is the common view that our actual vulnerability to corporeal defect, there's that word, and infirmity, that this is an original sin-caused privation of a natural good that's due to the human being. So understood in this way, uh, when we understand uh, our vulnerability as original sin caused, any actual privation of a particular person's relative corporeal good would, one, be a privation of her or his integral dignity. And two, it would be an impediment to the realization of that person's specific good in the good order of God's creation. Now, what I'm concerned with here is a, is a distorted view of our innate creaturely perfection. So our creaturely perfection, it's a perfection that we all bear right now and always as creatures created in the image and likeness of God. I'm interested in a distorted view that leads to a distorted understanding of the theological significance of impairment, illness, and injury. In yet other words, what I'm interested in is the tendency of some contemporary theologians to presume an idealized anthropological caricature in the development of theological reflection on the dignity and destiny of the human being. A caricature that presupposes a creature that is neither vulnerable nor dependent. So I'm going to begin with a concise Aquinas conversant sketch of the doctrines and anthropological principles outlined in the previous, uh, in, in the previous uh, sections. This is the narrative of redemptive history as I understand it. Uh, uh, Christians believe that the human being is a composite creature. 
spiritual and corporeal aspects, and that our greatest good involves uh, the kind of bodies that we have been given, a body that is vulnerable, that is corruptible. Of the various ways Christians have imagined the impassibility, agility, and subtlety of the human body before the fall, those preternatural qualities, those qualities that were above our nature, they've always been understood as derivative corporeal goods or perfections. Another way of saying that is that those, uh, they were relative perfections, originated in and sustained by an intimacy between the creature and creator. Now, before the fall, the glory of those spiritual intimacies and the friendship between God and the image of God, between creature and creator, it overflowed to the human body and elevated the body to a condition above its nature. So in the Christian understanding of what happened, coordinate with that understanding of that uh, primordial state, original harmony, the Christian understanding of our elevated state, the elevated state of humanity, is the Christian understanding of the event of original sin and the consequences of original sin. That is the fall from grace. So the spiritual wound of original sin was a, a primordial rupture or, or a break of intimate friendship shared between God and humanity. Understood in, in, that, in, in this way, uh, and then not, notwithstanding the, the various offense penalty metaphors that we find in the tradition, and that we make proper use of in the proper context. The corporeal consequences of, of original sin, humanity's fall from grace, it's not the result of a violent retaliatory injury or a metaphysical insult inflicted by God upon the dignity of humanity. Let me say that again. The corporeal consequences of original sin that we experience in our bodies Humanity's fall from grace. It was not the result of a violent retaliatory injury or a decreative metaphysical insult inflicted by God upon the dignity of humanity. Rather, uh, as taught by Augustine, as, uh, as reiterated by St. Thomas Aquinas and my understanding of the, of the Christian intellectual tradition, that the various implications of original sin that we experience in our bodies are the result of humanity's collective inheritance of wounded friendship with God and the concomitant loss or withdrawal of the secondary benefits that follow from our primor prim primordial intimacy with the Creator. So what then are these impairments, illness, and injuries? Like, what, what, what are they then? If, uh, if, if the reason why our bodies are vulnerable to damage, dysfunction, and decay isn't because God broke us. Uh, you know, we sinned and then God, just, you know, God harmed us, made us vulnerable. He, diminished, he degraded our nature. If that's not how Christians think about the fall, well, how do Christians think about the fall? And how does that help us understand and make sense of impairment, illness, and injury? This is how I, this is how I understand the Christian narrative. Created from the beginning to partake in the glory of the triune Lord of creation, humanity fell, it's the metaphor that's given, from a state of grace, a state of grace that allowed us to exceed our nature. And we're found universally alienated from the only grace that can preserve us, soul and body, in a, in a preternaturally, above nature, in a, state that is, uh, 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 in, in a state that is beyond our nature. So among the consequences, among the consequences of this primordial spiritual wound are the various impairments, illness, and injuries that coincide with our natural creaturely vulnerability. The various post-lapsarian disclosures of our innate vulnerability are privations of a relative corporeal good. However, because our corporeal vulnerability is an essential aspect of our creaturely nature and not a perversion of nature, these defects or infirmities, used in a qualified and specific sense, they don't diminish our incarnate creaturely dignity and they don't displace the fittingness of our composite nature. Rather, understood in this way, and this is, this is how I understand to be, this is what I understand to be the argument of St. Thomas Aquinas. In the light of the gospel, the various and unequal defects and infirmities and infirmities of the human body, they manifest the goodness of corporeality and the fitting beauty of our fragile flesh. This doesn't amount to a presumptuous explanation of why any of us might or might not experience corporeal impairment, illness, or injury in this life. 
And it doesn't imply a categorical association of, of, uh, of impairment and the experience of spiritual pain or physical pain. So the good news, as Christians tell it, is that God doesn't abandon us. Um, God doesn't abandon us in this state. No corporeal evil can decisively undermine the inviolable dignity and vocational aptitude of a human being to receive and respond to the love of God. And every Christian who's reconciled with God in Christ looks forward to the bodily resurrection of the dead, awaiting the final consummation of our hope. That is what Christians confess in the creed. There's a wonderful, uh, in, in a collection that's forthcoming from the Journal of Moral Theology, um, uh, 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 a theologian named Paul Gondreau, uh, he takes up uh, an argument that's been made in various ways uh, that many of, you, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with about what will our corporeal condition look like in the resurrection, especially for those of us whose lives have, and whose, uh, uh, who, whose lives and moral virtue, whose way of moving through the world has been shaped and impacted by impairment, illness, and injury. What will, those, what, are, what will those bodies look like in the resurrection? And Paul Gondreau uh, presents an argument from the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Augustine and Aquinas, uh, uh, it gives us a way to understand uh, what the resurrection body would look like uh, and it, by way of the, the glorious wounds of the martyrs. Um, uh, that, that there'll be marks of our humanity, the various ways that our humanity is impacted, impaired, uh, infirm, and weak that uh, to whatever extent it was conducive to virtue, it would be part of our resurrection bodies, but it would never be an impairment and it would never um, undermine uh, the subtlety and agility of the body. It would, it would, it would in fact be a crown, uh, it would afford a greater freedom. So there is a, there's an argument there about uh, there's an argument there, out there, where the wounds of original sin are conflated with the consequences of original sin. Uh, uh, to, uh, in short form, that argument basically goes like this, that there's a tendency to conflate the innate vulnerability and coordinate dependencies of the human body into the post serian evils we variously experience in our bodies. As if the human being was naturally invulnerable, naturally self-sufficient, and that now we found ourselves in an unnatural state of vulnerability and an unnatural state of dependency. This way of thinking has it that the, a natural quality or characteristic, like our innate vulnerability, coordinated with the first perfection of the human being, is awkwardly injected into theological discourse and engagement with the human experience. That unconsidered premise, that way of thinking about the body and our innate vulnerability, it provides a basis for theologians to wrongly suppose that the vulnerable human body lacks a specific good proper to the human being. That is, the allegedly natural good of being invulnerable to impairment, illness, and injury. That's we, that is not the kind of beings that we are. We are not naturally invulnerable to impairment, illness, and injury. We are not naturally invulnerable to impairment, illness, and injury. So according to that distorted view of the human body, human nature, and the corporeal consequences of original sin, the human body's susceptibility to material contingencies of our moral state is taken to be a defect or a privation of human nature as such. What this theological distortion of the Christian view implies is that a privation of any corporeal good amounts to a correlative privation of the goodness of corporeality. I'm going to say that again. What this theological distortion of the, of the Christian view implies is that a, a privation of any corporeal good amounts to a correlative privation of the goodness of corporeality. And I'd say that this conclusion is inconsistent with the traditional Christian account of our incarnate intellectual dignity, the fittingness of our vulnerability, and the enduring goodness of corpore corporeality after the fall. So to cash this out, and this, is, this has been the press, this has been the, uh, this has been the larger press of my argument here. Um, uh, there, there's a certain way that I've come to understand my theological vocation um, and how I approach and why I approach these arguments the way I do. Um, uh, I think I mentioned, uh, I, I did mention earlier that, that there's a particular kind of frustration and an anger that sometimes motivates me. Uh, people who dismiss my brother, who, who regard him as ugly, as, uh, as less human, as subhuman, makes me very angry. Um, 
when I was at a loss about how to talk and think, speak, and argue about those things, I found a resource in St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, I know that the, the, you know, the categories and the term, terminologies and the concepts that I just walked you through, they're kind of complex. Um, uh, it's not everyday conversation. It's not everyday speech around impairment, illness, and injury. But this is my poetry. This is the best poetry I have for my brother. It's the best I can do. Uh, these are my poems. This is, how I, this is how I talk about Jesus and scripture and faith and redemption and hope and the goodness and beauty of my brother, what I know to be true. This is how I, I understand and, and can even appreciate why, okay, I get what you're saying. I, I understand what you're saying about original sin and, and, the, and you know, wounds. And I, I, it's a way for me to engage brothers and sisters in Christ who have distorted and deformed views about what it means to be a human being. This is my poetry. This is the only way, this is the only response that I can offer. Um, in that spirit, I want to talk about and I want to make an argument for the beauty of my brother, uh, uh, as best as I understand, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, um, and, this, and that's where I'll end. So Christians recognize both the ugliness of the cross and the beauty of Christ's passion. We understand the beauty and goodness of mercy, that it presupposes some sort of evil, the evil of affliction. To hold forth that our fragile flesh is good and beautiful, just as when we affirm the beauty of Christ's passion, is to lay claim to a distinctively Christian vision of beauty and the kind of formation that allows one to recognize such beauty. That skill of aesthetic perception is well illustrated in the effective transformation and moral conversion experienced by St. Francis of Assisi. So you all know the story of St. Francis that one day he was praying enthusiastically and that was his bag, he, like he loved to pray enthusiastically. And he received a, re a response. He was uh, you know, the original charismatic. Uh, Francis was, it came the response, everything you loved carnally and, de and desired to have you must despise and hate if you wish to know my will. Because once you begin doing this, what, what before seemed delightful and sweet will be unbearable and bitter, and what before made you shudder will offer you great sweetness and enormous delight. So Francis was thrilled, first of all, I guess, because he received a word from God, um, but, uh, but he was thrilled because he, he, he was receiving a response uh, about what it meant for him to be a follower, a disciple of Christ. So one day Francis was riding along on his horse, and he met a leper, and even though uh, he was habituated, his way of moving through the world, he shuddered, at the sight and the approach of lepers, he made himself dismount. This, this is the language. He made himself dismount and he gave a coin to the man. And he kissed the man's hand as he did so. And the man kissed him back. Francis remounted and continued on his way. And as he went, he con considered himself less and less by God's grace. When he left there, what before had been bitter was, that is, to see, to see and touch lepers, was turned to sweetness. It became beautiful to him. So this is my question about St. Francis. What before had been bitter, that is to see and touch lepers, was turned into sweetness. What did Francis see? What did Francis see? What changed? Did Francis undergo some sort of bizarre distortion of his sensory experience of the world, you know, where things that were you know, truly revolting and smelled terrible, like they were deceptively veiled? with some sort of de deceptive uh, facade? Or rather, and this is what I think is the correct way to read it, and I think this is what St. Thomas commends us to, could it be that Francis simply learned to recognize the goodness and beauty that's, uh, that's easy to ignore and to avoid? I want to suggest that the beauty that Francis came to apprehend is the innate dignity and fitting purpose of the human being and the good order of God's creation. I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say it like I mean it, and I'm gonna say it like it's a poem for my brother. I want to suggest the beauty Francis came to apprehend is the innate dignity and fitting purpose of the human being in the good order of God's creation. That integral creaturely goodness and proportionate harmony is not a contradiction or conflict with the various ways the human body is vulnerable to defect and infirmity. Rather, it is through the innate vulnerabilities and coordinate dependencies of the human body that the specific goodness and beauty of the human body is made manifest. Understood in this way, the conversion of St. Francis' effective inclination, it can be understood as one of the ordinary transformations capacitated and offered by Christ 
to the church. I have in mind here an an affective transformation that's available to every Christian to accept or to reject in response to our own vulnerability and the vulnerability of our neighbor. There stands an invitation, one that prompts a personal response to either touch or withdraw from the beauty eternally revealed in Christ's passion and celebrated in the Eucharist and offered to doubting theologians in the splendor of Christ's glorified wounds. Thomas, put your finger here. This is my question. What difference would it make if Christian theologians, if those of us gathered here who want to think and speak well about these matters, if we learn to recognize the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh from the perspective of the Creator, uh, uh, it may be that Victor Prowler is correct, that the consequences of this refusal could be uh, quite profound and long-lasting, that it can affect our reasoning, and it can affect even what we find intelligible and what we do not. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you.